There are plenty of character beats and plot twists in Fast X to keep fans interested, but the real selling point of a Fast and Furious movie is the absolutely outlandish action. Fast X had so many unbelievable moments, we had to rank them. In F9, we meet Dom Toretto's disowned flesh-and-blood brother Jacob, which is an admittedly weird story choice for a series centered around the concept of family. Fortunately, John Cena more than held his own in F9 as Jacob, both as a cunning antagonist and as a soulful, tragic figure who gains redemption and rejoins the Fast family. Unfortunately, unlike in F9, Cena doesn't get to do a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat in Fast X. Despite Cena's obviously intimidating size, background in pro wrestling, and important role in the sequel, for the most part, he's relegated to a car or a spy plane. Luckily, there is one glorious scene of Jacob kicking butt and taking names in the film. It's towards the beginning when the agency is tasked with taking in Dom's family, including his son. That's when Jacob swings into action, throwing and shooting agency goons around the house to protect the Toretto's. This entire sequence culminates with an amazing shot of Jacob doing Cena's signature wrestling finish, the attitude adjustment, to send a corrupt agency goon through the floor as the camera follows the downed agent. From the characters' outsized personalities to the blaring melodramatic dance music score, to the saturated and constantly roving cinematography, Fast X runs on all cylinders even when something isn't crashing or blowing up. In most movies, a scene in which John Cena blows up a bunch of bad guys with a cannon car would be the most over-the-top moment, but Fast X is not most movies. It begins with Jacob and little Brian meeting at a secret underground rendezvous point to meet up with Dom. That's where they pick up the cannon car prototype Jacob has been working on. Unfortunately, bad guys show up instead, and Jacob has to drive little Brian in the cannon car to escape. Jacob then proceeds to blow the enemy cars away with massive G.I. Joe-style side-mounted cannons while little Brian looks on gleefully. While that may not be the healthiest response to seeing fiery death a child could express, at least he's having fun. Not very many people stay dead in the Fast and Furious saga. The arguably most impactful death on Dom's team, that of Han, was reversed in F9. Hedge, Roman, and Ramsey even had an entire subplot in that movie debating if they are all impervious to harm. Are you two maybe suggesting that we're what? Invincible? Maybe. Maybe. However, since the main series is said to be ending soon, some deaths might be more permanent. There's less road, so to speak, to bring them back. This means that, for better or worse, Jacob Toretto's explosive sacrifice might actually stick. After Dante kidnaps little Brian, and Dom and Jacob are in hot pursuit, Dom in his classic black Dodge Charger, and Jacob in his makeshift cannon car. However, Dante is surrounded by enemy vehicles, and Jacob's fuel line is cut so he can't keep up. He then decides to turn the cannons on his car toward the street and use the force of their blasts to propel him into the enemy cars blowing himself up along with all the villains except Dante, allowing Dom to catch up to his nemesis. Ever since Fast Five, the Fast and Furious films have become a spy action franchise and don't necessarily have a ton to do with street racing. But even the later sequels in the series have tried to shoehorn racing into the plot somehow. For instance, there's the street race in Cuba in the beginning of Fate of the Furious, in Fast X, the obligatory street race actually has some deadly stakes. Dom goes to Brazil to meet up with Diogo, a Brazilian street racer introduced in Fast Five. Car for car. Dante and his criminal thugs show up, and Diogo protects Dom from Dante as his crew outguns Dante's posse. Dante then proposes a street race to alleviate the standoff. Daniela Melchior's Isabella, who we find out is the sister of Elena, the mother of little Brian also joins the race. But not everything is as it seems. Apparently, Dante has rigged bombs on Diogo and Isabel's cars to make Dom choose who lives or dies. Dom ends up choosing to save Isabel, and Diogo blows up in a burst of flames. Dom also ends up losing the race to Dante, though that's a secondary consideration by that point. Fast X begins during the events of 2011's Fast Five. There's a remix of that film's famous heist, in which Dom and Brian drag the vault containing hundreds of millions of dollars of the Reyes crime family's money with their cars. 
This time, though, we see the events through the eyes of Jason Momoa's diabolical Dante Reyes. In the chase, Dante is knocked into the water. More than a decade later, near the end of Fast X, Dom is captured by the agency in Rio de Janeiro. Dante and his army of mercenaries then attack Dom and the agents. An explosive firefight ensues on the same bridge where the finale of Fast Five took place, literally bridging the two films. Ames, the acting head of the agency, seemingly becomes an ally to Dom as they fight Dante's mercenaries together. At one point, Dom uses a car door as a bulletproof shield. Tess, the daughter of Mr. Nobody, even shows up and gets into the fight before getting shot by a sniper and miraculously surviving, which is itself pretty badass. Charlize Theron's vicious villain, Cypher, first appeared in 2017's The Fate of the Furious. In that film, it's revealed that she's pretty much been the mastermind behind all of the other Fast and Furious villains since Fast Five. So it's an interesting turn when she shows up scared, bloodied, and beaten at the steps of Letty and Dom's humble abode. They surprisingly let her live because she warns them about the incoming threat of Dante. In a flashback, we see Dante casually entering Cypher's secret hideout to steal her tech, apparently on his own. She is unfazed at first, until all her trained security guards get phone calls from their family members who have been captured. They then turn on their former employer as Dante steals her stuff and walks away. Cypher then tries to fight off all her guards. At one point, she uses a large guard's body to cushion her fall from a crashing elevator. What makes this scene stand out, though, is how well it sets up Dante. He's flamboyant, scary, intelligent, and completely dismantles Cypher's operation in one scene. You know, do my best. After a botched mission in Rome, Letty is captured and sent to an off-the-grid agency prison. She finds herself in custody alongside Cypher, who initially helps Letty escape. Letty still, understandably, hasn't let go of her grudge against Cypher due to what she's done to her and her family in the last few movies. This leads to an awesome fight scene between the two in the midst of their escape. What really puts this scene over the top is the introduction of a laser robot in the middle of the fight. To be fair, the robot is ostensibly just a series of robotic appendages on a crane that cauterizes wounds, but during the fight, it becomes a ridiculous and entirely fun obstacle that Letty and Cypher have to dodge and weave around. Letty finishes the fight, but eventually comes back for Cypher's help when she realizes the prison is in the middle of Antarctica. After Jacob rescues little Brian from agency goons, he and his nephew go on the run. The plan is for them to drive to an airport and fly to a predetermined rendezvous point. Little Brian is initially disappointed with Jacob's seemingly janky car from the 90s with a kayak on top, but the two end up bonding. This includes a sequence where Jacob shows Brian the wonders of Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch's 1991 hit single, Good Vibrations, even teaching the kid some dance moves. Upon entering the airport, they are immediately caught on camera by the agency, but Jacob doesn't seem too perturbed. While on the plane, Jacob nonchalantly asks a flight attendant for some alcohol, which he receives alongside a mysterious key. He then beckons little Brian to the back of the plane with him, where he quickly dispatches some agency goons. In the cargo hold, Jacob unzips his kayak, revealing a miniature Batman-style spy glider, which he quickly assembles. Then, he uses the alcohol as quick fuel to help with their descent. Finally, he uses the mysterious key to open up the cargo hatch, and he and Brian fly out of the 747 in the glider. It's borderline nonsensical and very cool. Up to Fast X, the only seemingly permanent death of a protagonist in the series was that of Giselle Yashar, a former associate in Mr. Nobody's agency before joining the crew in 2009's Fast and Furious. She died sacrificing herself to save her love interest Han in the climactic mission to bring down Owen Shaw, the villain of Fast and Furious 6. But like Han's death, Giselle's didn't stick. So I got my postcard now. After Cypher and Letty escape their prison, they are still stranded on the barren continent of Antarctica. That is, until a giant nuclear submarine bursts out from underneath the ice. The top hatch opens up to reveal an alive and well Giselle. It's the only time we see her in the film, but it raises so many questions. How did she survive? Where has she been this whole time? Why is she working for Cypher now? And with so many other plots and characters to service in the remaining films, will any of this get explained? Yes, 
Han eats muffins laced with hallucinogenic drugs, and he trips out for a scene. It all starts once it's revealed that Dante is using Cypher's stolen tech to digitally steal the crew's immense wealth and pay for an army of violent mercenaries. Luckily, Roman has stacks of cash, so they look for black market guns and vehicles to buy. Fortunately, the crew's resident super hacker, Ramsey, knows about a secret black market operation in London, headed by her former associate, the Shady Bowie. The place they go to is a fake storefront that deceptively seems to be stuck in the 90s, with old cream-colored PCs with CRT monitors. Ramsey points out it's the last place the authorities would look for a high-tech operation. Later on, Han finds Bowie has special muffins sitting on his desk, which he casually helps himself to. We then see Han's POV, colors and images swirling and dancing. It's reminiscent of a lot of drug trips seen in movies, but it's shocking to see it happen so blatantly in a Fast and Furious sequel. After Jacob's sacrifice, Dom is chasing down Dante and little Brian in his iconic black 1970 Dodge Charger RT. Unfortunately for Dante, Dom is unaffected by nonsense like physics. So he's able to drive his car so that the helicopters Dante has sent to harpoon Dom's car crash into each other and explode. Dom then swings the tethered helicopters like two giant medieval flails that slam into Dante's muscle car. It's a nice callback to the tethered vault that originally brought down Dante in the flashback. This also gives Dom an opportunity to speed up to Dante's car, and he gets little Brian to jump into his speeding charger just in time. This all culminates with Dom and little Brian in the Dodge Charger, trapped between two speeding big rigs being driven remotely by Dante on top of the Hoover Dam. There's no escape, except this is a Fast and Furious movie, so Dom decides to literally drive down the side of the Hoover Dam while outrunning the billowing explosion from the crashed big rigs. Fast X sort of peaks early when Roman leads a heist mission in Rome to steal a dangerous microchip. It all turns out to be a trap set up by Dante. When Tej and Ramsey get inside the truck that's supposed to contain the chip, it turns out it's carrying a giant spherical bomb instead. Dante releases the bomb onto the streets of Rome, causing it to roll into and crush everything in its path. At one point, the bomb crashes into a gas pump, creating a giant, billowing explosion. Dante's plan is for the bomb to blow up the Vatican. What are we blowing up? What? The Vatican? Wow. You guys are going to hell. But Letty and Dom show up to save the day. Dom uses a crane to push the bomb into the water. Even so, the explosion does a lot of damage, and Dante successfully gets the media to lay the blame on Dom and his crew, sending them all underground. What makes this scene so great is all the little unique touches, such as Letty using her motorcycle to jump over debris while chasing Dante down, and how the rolling bomb splits a bus in two. 